Hi everyone, thank you for joining um, and welcome to this Summer to Evolve session um, on employee referrals. Um, thank you for joining, appreciate your attendance today. Um, I will roll through some introduction slides before we introduce our guest today, um, but appreciate everyone joining. So next slide. So today we've got a great session. Um, we've been joined by MT Ray and Josh Anderson, um, who will join us in a little bit. Um, the really focus of this session is to understand how to engage uh, and incentivize employees to help with employee referrals. So this is really about trying to build the best talent networks from your employee base, um, how to incentivize those processes, how to make that a seamless loop and keep your employees involved in understanding what the process is, how to maximize value from that, and really make that a solid source of candidates uh, for your hiring process. Um, just a little bit about the Summer to Evolve. Um, if you haven't been on one of these sessions before, um, this is a 12-week program. We have over 45 sessions across a range of different talent topics. Um, all this content is free um, and is available on our website, um, but really it's trying to maximize uh, you know, your role in your, in your jobs and give you new tips and tools around using different content and tools to be, to be able to help with the hiring process. Um, and all this is available on the job web website. This is week six uh, of the program, so employee referrals. Um, there's still another six weeks to go post this, so please do sign up and join. Um, lots of good content around this. We have around four or five sessions per week on these topics, um, so plenty uh, of good material there to, to help you with your roles. Um, we actually had a good session yesterday on referrals as well. That's available on the website. This was a rep from Brett Bazzini on the basics of a successful employee referral program. Um, this was a very kind of focused skill session on how to make referrals work as well, rather than the open discussion we're having today. Um, but you should definitely check that out if you want additional materials on referrals. Um, and this is a website you can find all that content now. So please do uh, log on and have a look. Um, it's all free. Um, everything's documented. We have good videos and good material there for you to download. Um, so please check it out. So um, today we've got a couple of great guests for you. Um, and essentially what we're looking to do is have an open discussion around employee referrals in the workplace. We have two seriously talented individuals to help us go through that process. Um, our first guest is MT Ray. I think she should be popping up on the screen now. Hey MT, how's it going? We can't quite hear you yet, but I'm sure you will. Here I it. am. Hi Chris, good to see you. There you are. Hey. Um, so MT Ray is a founder of Mars Ray Talent. Um, she's had some really notable roles um, in the ecosystem. She led the global recruiting effort for Exact Target um, in and up until their acquisition by Salesforce. So that was a really high growth story. Um, I'm sure there's lots of good war stories around the startup process there and building different programs and initiatives. Um, she's also been recognized as a woman of influence um, in the Indiana Business Journal, I believe. And she also co-chairs in the Women in Tech Summit. Um, <clears throat> so summer favorites, you've given us a few tips here. Career vacation Tahiti, um, I've never been, but it sounds amazing. Um, favorite summer movie, Caddyshack, uh, ice cream truck order, um, anything it sounds like, chocolate. Mm -hmm. Hamburg hamburger, hot dog, hamburger, and then pool or beach, beach. I'm not sure we've got anyone who said pool so far, so that fits in line <laughs> with everything we've seen so far. Um, is that a good summary, MT, anything to add? No, that's a great summary. I love summer. So thanks for having cool. me today. No, thank you for joining us. Um, next, we should have Josh as well. He pops up. Hey, Josh, you hear us? Hi. Yes. Hi. Thrilled to be here. Thank you for joining. Um, so Josh is EVP of External Affairs at Teach America. Um, you might ask what that has to do with recruiting, but it does include all recruiting effort as well at Teach for America. Um, and they have a really interesting program around hiring for different kinds of roles and people who are being kind of corpse members within Teacher America. Um, you studied at Princeton, so you're Princeton alum. Um, I believe you're Chicago based still as well, is that right, Josh? Mm -hmm. And you were an original yes, corpse member. So you've been through the entire Teacher America process end to end. That's right. Very cool. Um, okay, favorite look vacation sleeping bear sand dunes so i actually had to look this up josh it does look amazing but i'm getting that some kind of kind of national park is that right yeah it's just, just beautiful area of the northern michigan coast along lake michigan and it's just it's incredible very cool Good stuff um favorite song movie independence day it's a classic um no need to update that in the last 20 years it's still still good um <laughs> <laughs> ice cream truck order salty caramel sugar cone 
very good. Um, of course, Chicago style hot dog, I wouldn't expect anything less, and then another beach. So all fits in with the plan here. Um, anything to add, Josh? No, uh, really excited to be here. Um, and I too love summer. This is an atypical yeah. summer, but I still love it. Yeah. All right, guys, thank you very much. Um, so I think we're going to move into the questions now. No, we're not. I've got to introduce myself. So um, a little bit about me. So I am London based, as you can probably tell by the accent. So I founded a business called Rollpoint. Um, it's now part of the Joblight family. So we focused on employee referrals um, specifically. So we learned a lot over our kind of six, seven years around kind of what works and what doesn't work in employee referrals, um, both approaches within systems and kind of offline approaches as well. Um, I think we want to dig into some of the offline approaches later, but really give you some tips as to what we've seen work for clients and what doesn't work so well. Um, but it kind of spans around 200 different companies we worked with across that time. Um, I'm really excited to kind of share some of that knowledge with you guys um, and give you some tips and tricks on you know, how to make this work. Um, whether you've got budget or not, we want to make this kind of open to everybody to really uh, you know, show you some of the learnings we've had along the way. Um, if you've got any questions, please do ask. I think there's a panel on the GoToMeeting. Um, we'll deal with the questions during the session as well. Um, please tag us if you're online with the job by um, S2E hashtag. Um, and then this will be recorded and you can be able to share this with any colleagues uh, or contacts you have in, in the industry afterwards. Okay. So, sorry, I'll go back one. So let's open up the discussion then. Um, so this will be pretty free form for everyone online. So we're going to really let the conversation kind of direct itself as to what's going to be valuable and any questions we do get in. Um, I'd say to open open us up, um, let's start with something slightly more broad. Um, given you guys have worked in several different organizations and I think different sectors as well, especially for you, Josh, um, you know, what do employee referrals mean you know, to your organization and your employer brand? So what do they represent and why are they kind of impactful in what you do? Yeah, and, I'm happy to start. Yeah, I'm happy to start on that. Um, you know, I did lead global recruiting at Exact Target, as you mentioned, Chris, and I would say we had such a strong employer brand. Um, it was very easy to attract talent, and um, our employees were our best recruiters. I mean, they were the ones who understood the culture, understood what we were all about. Um, we called our culture orange, so uh, that was kind of what we branded it, and everyone knew what orange meant. And so for them to go out and find talent that was, you know, would fit our culture um, as a recruiting leader, it was awesome because that's where we got most of our best hires. Um, and yeah. as any recruiter knows, as you go through piles and piles of resumes, uh, when you get referrals and you get referrals from strong uh, performers in your own company, those are the resumes you look at first. Yeah, and I mean, a quick question on that. Did, mm -hmm. did that process change as you grew? What was the, the difference between when you started there and when you finished? Was it harder, easier? What was the difference? Um, you know, I think um, as Exact Target started, you know, a software tech company, um, a lot of the first hires were, you know, networking and referrals already yeah. of people they knew. And then as the company grew and went global, obviously we were out of our, you know, little niche market uh, here in Indianapolis. So um, we had to use our employees to help find talent and find people they worked with. So we created a program, you know, we branded the program, uh, we educated our employees on the roles and what we were looking for. So we really uh, leveraged our employees to help us find the best talent. Great, okay, thanks MP, that's perfect. Um, and then I guess for you, Josh, so referrals play a different role in, in what you do. Um, I mean, it sounds like something where a lot of it is referral orientated in terms of the corpse members you have who join um, the organization. But again, how does that work from a high level? Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, I think similar to what MP said, uh, referrals are essential to how we do business. Um, and so I'm going to refer a bit here to my experience. I, I spent several years leading our recruitment and admissions team at Teach for America. And specifically, I'm going to talk about how we recruit new teachers. That's what we call core members into our program, about three, 4,000 a year um, from uh, right out of sort of top undergraduate universities uh, or institutions across the US. And really um, what we do in any given year is it's, it's working with our first and second year teachers uh, from a given college uh, who come through a given college and really leveraging them to identify who are the most promising prospects on a given campus 
um, and then actually tailoring our outreach, uh, set, setting our sights on those folks and tailoring our outreach accordingly, their willingness to recommend and refer folks to us, um, uh, and then in turn, uh, the credibility uh, we have as a result of their friends and people they look up to who are in our program saying, this is a really important uh, and powerful opportunity. Uh, it's everything. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I, I guess one question on that is, given it sounds more informal, but completely kind of holistic, you, know, you need referrals for everything you're doing. It's a big part of what you guys did to recruit people into the process. Uh, if you were going to go and ask somebody what those top five or 10 people look like in their network, who they like to approach or you guys could approach for that role. Uh, was that very informal? Was that something you document? Like how did that process work? Yeah, it's, it's, um, there's a, there's definitely a, a formal strategy. It's highly decentralized in approach. Um, so basically it's our, it's our campus recruiting teams who work with the current first and second year teachers who, who've gone to a given university that they're responsible for to say, okay, Here's what we look for in our incoming teachers. These are the two, three most important characteristics. Who are the folks in your network uh, who uh, most embody these traits? Um, and then we very much log those. So it's, uh, it's about building a relationship and a buy-in to the recruiting process among our first and second year teachers and then our young alumni of our program uh, to get them then to formally refer um, and then make introductions in many cases to uh, friends in their network who are current juniors and seniors uh, at their alma mater. Okay, great. That's helpful. Um, and the same question to you, MT. Like, what was the, did you have a similar process of like profiling certain sets of people, the top 10 engineers or top 10 sales people? How did it work? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think educating on the culture and the brand, which people knew once they joined Exact Target, what what it felt like to be orange. But I think then as we had top performers in certain roles um, to profile, you know, what was their background? You know, where do they come from? What skills did they have? What behaviors did they have? And then how do we, you know, make sure our job descriptions and our hiring managers are clear as they're assessing talent. So I think it became more analytical, like you said, and evolved as the company got larger. We saw what success looked like and what companies people came from or what universities people came from. And try to really target, um, you know, use our own employees to target people uh, with those backgrounds. Okay, that's okay, no, great. Um, and I, I guess a linked question for you both. Um, I think a lot of people when they're either running recruitment organizations or recruiters, um, there's a big difference between a, a refer, like a referral program and more of a kind of culture. I see them as quite different or a binary, to be honest. So where would you say you guys fitted on that? Were you doing campaigns for when you suddenly had big hiring increases? Or were you trying to build this DNA from day one or doing both? How did you guys see it? I would say using from the exact target days, we did both. I mean, I think it started out more just who you knew and your network and, you know, the brand and who we were and what types of people and skill sets we needed. But as we evolved and as we got larger, we became more structured and we actually branded the program. It was called Infuse Orange, um, which was awesome. We had an employment branding, you know, uh, uh, resource on the HR team so we really really were able to brand it and then educate and push a lot out and do a lot of campaigns internally um, we'd also do you know uh, for hard to fill jobs or hires that were in demand we would do a, you know an increased incentive um, and that was always very popular <laughs> because people could uh, make additional dollars um, if they were able to really stop and think about who they knew um, and so many times, um, you know, using agencies, et cetera, you get a candidate through the pipeline and all of a sudden someone internally is like, oh, I know them. And I'm like, gosh, we're paying this external firm, you know, 20 percent, 30 percent of salary <laughs> when if I could just pay you or whatever, um, you could have brought this person, you know. So, again, educating on, you know, stopping and thinking about who they knew, but yeah, definitely making more structured as we went more global. And naming a program sounds like a small thing, but it, it really does change educational awareness of these programs. So it's actually pretty important. And we tend to see that the best companies always have their own domain name and their own name for their program, where someone yeah. can easily go to refer a candidate. So that makes sense. And then, Josh, I, I guess you guys have intakes as well, right? Um, so was that mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. the center of your referral experience? Well, I, to go back to the question you posed a second ago, this, this is um, the I will just say it's part of our a core part of our culture 
Um, and this is one of the things where maybe as a nonprofit organization, there's a, a little bit of a built-in advantage um, uh, because it's all about pursuing a mission, um, educational equity uh, for low-income children across the United States. And, and uh, once you join this organization, once you join this effort, um, you feel and you're, you're steeped in, in a group of people in a culture where you feel an imperative to help and grow and expand that movement uh, and that effort. And so it's built into your uh, sort of the culture and experience from day one that we're always looking to grow the force of leaders who are working and fighting and advocating for equity for low income children. Um, and then we formalize that um, a few months into your experience when you have a, a sit down uh, with uh, one of our recruiters who's responsible for your alma mater. And, and that's when we do the sort of intake of, OK, let's build our let's build our list of um, uh, who were uh, who are some of the top prospects uh, we should be uh making a point to initiate contact with this year. Okay, no, that, that, that makes sense. Um, so it sounds like a bit of both on your side then, essentially culture is very right. important, but increasing awareness at the same time. Okay, perfect. Um, I, I guess you mentioned incentives there. So MT, I'm interested to hear your experience on that process. So I'm, I'm guessing it was financially rewarded. You were fast growing, trying to get your hands on everybody in the indie area. Um, yes. What's your What's your view on financial incentive for this process? I mean, I, you know, it worked. <laughs> it did work, especially um, for roles like sales. At one point, I, you know, was working very closely with the sales team and always looking to hire, you know, new talent and account executives. And when you went out and put money on it for current account executives to refer people they used to work with that had backgrounds that we desperately needed, um, boy, they stopped and thought about it when they thought they could make you know, a little extra cash. We actually did one where it was like a sliding, you know, a kind of an increased. So the first referral that was hired was one amount. If they hired, if we had two, they doubled. It was yeah. three, it tripled. I mean, and, you know, there was times I remember joking with some of the leaders, like they're going to stop selling because they can just refer people in and make more money than selling our software. But uh, it definitely motivated the salespeople for sure. Um, did not get to the point at exact target anyway, where uh, the opportunity to you know donate your money to a charity or or you know do something more altruistic was involved. It was really cash driven at that time, and it did work. Um, and for hard to fill jobs, we weren't afraid to pay the money versus using an external firm. We really went to using zero external agencies um, and used our own network and our own team to find talent. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, one thing we did we learned at Rollpoint at least that. You had companies who got to a threshold at some point, usually around kind of three or four thousand dollars, at which point people actually were disincentivized from referring because they start to associate the fill or the role with somebody of that value. And it's really about you start to strip out what could be great candidates in the network for that. Um, so it, there's definitely a balance to be struck in terms of money, and it's not always the answer. Um, and I guess on that note, Josh, like any financial incentives involved, or is it completely just a part of the culture, part of the team, let's, let's help this. I think that's a great question. We have not historically done anything financial to incent referrals. Um, that said, it's, it's something we are actively considering for the future because um, there's a, when, when you're in an early stage uh, or building your brand um, as a nonprofit organization uh, and there's a sort of a wind at your back, um, in terms of a growing political importance to the sort of the social change effort you're part of, um, I think there's a sense of just like it, it, it feels like everyone feels obliged to make sure that they're playing an active role in building the, the force of the next uh, class of recruits. Uh, as you get further in your life cycle, that, uh, that sense of uh, the organization needing help in it, your be and being your imperative to help, uh, the organization find the next class that has waned for us. And so I think we do need to actively consider um, or we are actively considering ways to um, really get um, our, our people to help us more actively. Yeah. And I mean, some some of the research we do that may be helpful for everyone as well is that we we always like divide them between financial incentives, um, social capital incentives or like altruistic incentives. So financial is kind of well understood. Um, but I mean, even even from the financial perspective, you can do smaller rewards for more activity. So, you know, giving an Amazon gift card for your first 10 referrals or your first five referrals, if you've never done that before, usually works a lot better than a, a $5,000 reward on any kind of successful hire. So if you reward the behavior of making the referral rather than the successful outcome, culturally that works a lot better in the long term. 
often actually kind of waiting until someone's been through the whole process, then been hired, then through a probation period. And usually it's more financially effective as well. Um, on the social capital side, this is really about this recognition of people who are top referrers, filming the video case studies, those kind of things. That tends to be very important educationally, especially if you get senior management involved. So if you can get your CEO to be involved in congratulating a referrer on bringing in a great candidate, that will do quite a lot for your program long term. And then on the altruism side, this is just about turning the financial donation um, into a charity donation. And you'd be amazed again, people will really start referring. And especially the people who don't get motivated by the financial side more, this is your engineers, your R&D people, people in HR even potentially, who may not be able to be eligible for referral. So there's like three different routes you can take. Um, and it's definitely worth trying those other two because they are super effective. Um, and all the companies have kind of got to that 30, 40, 50% referral rate overall for their hiring. have kind of used these tools to, to get there, you know? I, um, I would jump on the social capital one because I think that's another big uh, way for people to be recognized for building the team. I mean, especially on the sales side where, the, where I did a lot of recruiting, you know, they like that recognition. They like their egos to be boosted up. They like to see their name on the slide at the uh, quarterly meeting to say they referred someone or a top performer came from them. Yeah. Um, so I just think that's another awesome way to uh, just recognize people who refer. And, uh, and it's interesting, a lot of these things roll into education and employee engagement. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's all kind of three different spokes of the same outcome. Um, so that, mm -hmm. that's a good tip as well. I think it's part of the same effort. Well, I, I guess on that basis, um, I guess you may know this for MT for exact target. What does a successful referral rate look like? I mean, what what do you want it to be? Yeah, I mean, we um, you know, we had lofty goals back then. Um, ours was close to fifty percent, which okay. I think is high. I mean, I'm not sure today what uh, you're seeing, Chris, but at the no, time, that, that is very think, high, yeah. yeah, I mean, it was in the low thirties initially, and I think we got it up to like forty seven ish. Um, which was great. And then when we were acquired by Salesforce, they were at that level, if not higher. So again, it's just building that program and educating employees and rewarding them. It worked. And I think the cultures in both of those companies, Exact Target and Salesforce, are so strong um, and so family oriented. It just, um, not that it made it easy, but it was easier to find talent uh, within our own networks. Great. Well, that's, 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 that's good context. I guess, I guess, Josh, so it may not be like as incidentally tracked in the same way of like an ATS making a referral, but I'm supposing, you know, majority of your hires have come through some sort of referral at some stage, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, the majority come through, um, I and mean, the majority are come to us, vast majority in fact, come to us from our, our uh, current core members and alumni base. Okay, great. Um, and I guess leading to the next, question um linked into how many referrals do we want um in terms of like diversity and inclusion this is the topic which is really important right now how does referrals be like a powerful enabler of that there's a, there's a lot of discussion around this and i've seen it for my entire career dealing with referrals is really does it enable it or does it disable diversity um and do you guys have any tips or processes that you've gone to specifically address diversity and spreading uh, you know, a more fair ecosystem of employee base and hiring opportunities, but via employee referrals. Yeah, I would say um, what you employee referrals do end up creating could be a catch 22 and that you're hiring everyone who looks like you and acts like you and comes from the same yeah. backgrounds and you have no diversity. So I totally get that. I mean, I think there are ways around it. Um, and I'm still trying to understand if I, if I like the fact that you could maybe offer a higher incentive for someone who's in a diverse category, um, more targeted referrals of you know, trying to get more diversity into your company. Um, I think talking to employees about diversity and just telling them that, you know, maybe it doesn't need to be an increased referral amount or an incentive, but just the importance of diversity in the workplace in general and how that just makes teams stronger and the more diverse candidates that get referred, you know, better for the company as a whole. Um, I've never used outside sources for referrals, so I don't know if you have, Chris or Josh, where you're incentivizing people outside your company to refer people that are diverse. Um, I don't know how that would work, but I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, yeah, no, but, we, we, we've definitely definitely tested that, um, and it tends to be very hard to manage. It becomes mm -hmm. almost like a talent, talent network referral. 
Um, yeah. We've launched them several times, um, uh, you know, really as an agreement with a client that they'd like to have this. Um, it's definitely not a silver bullet, I put it that way. Um, and you tend to find people more interested in financial gain from that process. And you get into very, very kind of difficult tax consequences and follow-ups and who these people are who are making these referrals. It, it, it spreads quite quickly. So typically it, it wouldn't work. I'm not saying it can't work, um, but it tends to be kind of shut down after three to six months. It's usually about your internal employees. But I, I guess the, the question is, if you if you haven't hit the diversity rate, which you would want to build your company in that view, can you build a more diverse workforce from referrals? It, it sounds like you're a, a yes on that, MT. Uh, I, I would say yes, but I think it goes back to the education and it goes back to the you know the values of the company and, and the diverse workplace that, that we're trying to create. And then how do you make sure you're educating uh, your team on that and what the long-term goals are? And we need their help to get there. Um, I think employees just want to be talked to and be part of a solution. And communication is such a, a big part of company culture in general, especially referrals, and to make people feel part of building something and have the, you know, have the outcomes uh, be relying on their involvement and, you know, them helping. I mean, I, people just love that. I, I just think that's a, it's a great motivator to build diversity. So it, so it almost sounds like being transparent in the aim as well, not, not yeah. it just being a generic referral program and saying we have things to achieve through this process and you can help us do that. Yeah, no, no fear in sharing that our diversity numbers maybe aren't what they should be and how important yeah. it is to be a diverse company. It's only going to make us all better. And then how do you guys help us get there? Um, and, I, and I just think employees just I, in the companies I've worked with where we had very transparent leadership, um, that really just drives the behaviors and, and helps the team. Yeah, that's great. And I guess, Josh, you've got a very formed opinion on this as well, given what you guys do. Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, I would argue that uh, a more diverse workforce and a diverse, equitable, and inclusive organization is mission critical for, for any organization, company, institution in the world. But um, it, it's been, uh, we've understood it as mission critical for, for a long time. Um, and, uh, you know, just our, a few dimensions of, of thoughts here. Um, just first, our, our, our journey on this, you know, 15 years ago, uh, about a third of the people who came in to Teach for America every year uh, identified as people of color. Uh, for the last five plus years, that's been more than 50% of incoming uh, teachers or core members of the program identify as people of color. Um, that is a result of just really intentional effort uh, to build the pipeline of strong, diverse, qualified candidates. Um, and absolutely, um, how you leverage your current class of core members and your young alumni is essential to uh, building a more diverse pipeline of candidates in a given year. And for us, just to take it, you know, bring it down to like a college campus level or a graduate school level with, you know, some of the prime places where we're focusing our recruiting energy, um, it's about leveraging your existing employee base, in our case, these core members and alumni, to figure out what are their networks and then ensuring their uh, giving us a referral, a, a set of referrals and leads of a really diverse and strong um, potential candidate base. And it's just, I guess the biggest um, underpinning belief for us is that, you know, systemic um, inequity and racism is just pervasive in the world. And if you don't intentionally do something different in your efforts to try to interrupt that, you're just going to end up with uh, a non-diverse workforce. Um, and so you just have to, uh, at every turn, um, have intentional strategies you're putting to work uh, to interrupt the patterns that are naturally playing out in the world due to just our long history uh, here in the U.S. at any rate. Yeah, no, that's great. So, I mean, it sounds like between those two responses, intentional strategy, that you're actually kind of baselining where, where you want to be and changing course based on those aims but also communication with the employee base to share that ambition as well, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, cool, great, thank you guys. Um, and I, I guess just in terms of kind of practical things that you guys have done. So, you know, we spent a lot of time looking at the, the offline. So that's everything that's not about using a platform or a system to generate referrals. Um, any kind of top two or three things you guys have used or seen um, from your experience in the something which would move the needle in terms of generating referrals, whether from a diversity standpoint or any, but you know, what have you seen that has been successful for you that doesn't cost a lot of money, 
as something that recruiters can, can do in their daily, daily basis. Well, I know um, we've used the onboarding, uh, during onboarding, uh, asking new hires to write down three names. Um, you have a very captive audience. <laughs> they're sitting there in a new hire session. Uh, they haven't started yet, so they're not too busy to think about it. And you really ask them to think about who they know in their past lives of their career that were top performers and people they'd like to work with again, and ask them to refer names right there on the spot uh, in the new hire process. And that's worked. I mean, that just kind of fills the funnel. Um, and then always using, uh, you know, I always use references. Anytime I had to check a reference for a candidate, I was always checking out that person as a possible uh, candidate as well. So, uh, you know, similar or, or referral, ask the reference for other people that are similar to the person that we just are about to hire. Yeah, and I think it's just you guys having a really open mindset to everybody could be a potential hire at any yeah. point in the next kind of five years, you know. Yeah. Every candidate is a customer, you know, so, you know, you just have to treat them like a customer and you never know where, what they're going to say about your brand. You never know what they're, who they're going to refer to you or not. So you just have to treat everyone, you know, the same. Yeah. Well. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Without doubt. And Josh? Yeah. Uh, first, I would just say that the give us three names during onboarding trick is a very good one. And it, 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 it consistently it consistently works. Um, and the other thing I was going to say, and this is, um, this is relevant beyond those who are doing recruiting on a college campus or graduate schools, business schools and so on and so forth, uh, in tapping into other sort of forms of ways people organize themselves professionally. Um, but for us, it's. It, one thing we found is just it is hugely helpful to get our current employees just invested in the challenge of figuring out how to crack the code at their alma mater. They're just because it sort of blends two places they have pride in, um, Teach for America and that alma mater. Um, and if they can basically put their energy to work helping us crack the code of how to attract more leaders. Um, and so bringing them into the what should our strategy be here? What should our events uh, and marketing approach look like this year at, at your at your alma mater. Bringing them into that um, just unlocks a different kind of energy from them. We find. Yeah, very cool. Good tip. Um, and I, I guess on off the back of that, what what is the process look like for people who are referring? So your internal employees want to be incentivized to do this. They need clear communication on on, on where somebody is being you know, put into the pipeline, or are they being approached for a certain role? Um, what's policy, what's best of class policy look like in your eyes for um, an internal employee who, ha who has made a referral? Well, I know we did our best to try to talk to all referrals only because they came from an employee and we're asking for their help and we don't want to, you know, ghost, ghost one of the referrals or have them go into a black hole. So we did our best to talk to every referral and keep them in our database. And if uh, down the road they didn't work out now, maybe down the road they'd work out for another position. We were also pretty clear with all employees that um, their name was behind that referral and that anytime one of the people from the recruiting team or a manager could call them to ask them about their referral. So to make sure that they uh, you know, thought about that before they put their name behind someone, just don't throw something at the wall and hope it's gonna stick. Let's make sure you're really thinking about the person, the role, the skill set, the culture, and that you know, they feel this would be a good representation of their brand. So um, just accountability. Um, so that we're not spending time spinning. I remember once we did a, a little like spiff to give extra money for a referral and I had one employee like on LinkedIn just finding people and sending me blind, you know, LinkedIn profiles. And I'm like, yeah. whoa, you know, time out. That's awesome that you want to do that. But that's not the purpose of this, this program. It's people you've worked with or you know that you want to refer and put your name behind. And I'm not sure some of these you're sending me, you'd want to put your name behind them. So uh, it's education and they were doing their best. They were motivated, but just wasn't uh, the right uh, reasons. So that's really not a tick box for education, but also like qualifying referrals or making sure there's an expectation on the name submitted. So and it's, yeah. it's not always about more more names necessarily, is it? It's really about qualifying it. And we, I mean, we, we worked out that if you could get one referral per person from your company each year, that's generally enough to, to fill your entire hiring pipeline um, if you're hiring at you know, a, a normal rate for an average American company. Um, so mm -hmm. that's interesting. Um, yeah. And on your side, Josh, any kind of, you know, employee treatment or communication that you do to keep them in the loop in the process? 
Yeah, we, we number one, just as MT said, uh, very much prioritize and have, have a rule that, you know, if you give us a lead, we're going to, we're going to follow that lead. And, and, and even more so, we're going to, um, uh, give that person highly tailored outreach and introduction, uh, to make sure that they're sort of brought in. But you're, you're right. There's a prerequisite kind of education that's happened with our folks so that they know who it is that we're looking for, who's going to meet the bar, uh, so that they're giving us, uh, informed and, and high value referrals. Um, and then the second thing is absolutely looping back with the employee who's given the re referral to say, hey, we've done this outreach. Oftentimes, or, or not just oftentimes, as a, as a general pattern of practice, we will bring then that employee into the cultivation process of that candidate. Um, if they're, if we, once we sort of get a little further in with them, say, wow, this is a very high value candidate and we think they have a very good chance of success in our process. That's really cool. I've actually not heard of that before. There being like an engagement between the referred candidate and the employee who referred them. So that's super interesting that you actually take a proactive approach to doing that. Okay. Um, so, so one final thing I wanted to share, just in terms of like offline materials, I think we just touched on it there. But I mean, one thing we have seen like outside the ecosystem of technology, um, we've been talking about awareness quite a bit, but I, I think that in terms of practical guidance, we we see huge uplift just from internal, less so when we have less offices now to have people in to see these things. But in terms of kind of, you know, swag, events, posters, mugs, leaflets, or flyers on employees' desks, those things absolutely do work. And it sounds like a very basic thing, um, but it definitely cuts through the email noise of what these programs do and how they exist. So that's something definitely to, to consider as part of this, of this process. Um, I mean, do we think that gets any easier or harder based on the change of circumstance that we're currently in? Um, would you expect a less successful referrals culture based on the current circumstances? Because I'd imagine it could be that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did a lot of, like you mentioned, swag and desk drops and ways to educate and put it in front of everyone. But you're right, in the environment today where we're not in offices, um, how do you go about doing it and what other means can you use? So yeah, without using just email to inundate people. So whether it's Slack or other ways to do campaigns, I, I'd be interested in hearing the responses to that as well. Yeah. It, it, in some ways, this is a little bit the way we've always had to operate, not, be, uh, not because <laughs> we were prepared for these circumstances, but because um, when our new teachers come in, they're joining Teach for America, we train them, we help them get certified and then we place them with a local school district. So their employer is actually a local school district and, you know, um, cause they're a teacher of record, a first year, or second year teacher in, you know, many different school districts across the United States. Um, and what that means though, is that our national team and specifically our recruitment and admissions team, uh, our way of interacting with our core members has always been mainly virtual once they're uh, out in the field. Um, and so our strategies uh, for, keeping the recruiting process, um, making referrals, um, and keeping them engaged um, in uh, recruiting the next generation to come behind them. Um, uh, I, I, we, we're envisioning that this year will look a lot like, in fact, last year and many years before. Um, that, that's really interesting. Um, well, 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 good luck with the program as well, Josh, for this year. It sounds like you've got a lot of people to get referred in, as you do every year, I suppose. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, as I sit I here, Chris, and think, as I sit here and think about this topic, um, you know, gosh, with people at home now, people maybe have more time to think about who they have as referred, exactly who they can refer. You know, so it's like if leadership starts talking about it, or there's all hands meetings, or whatever communication methods uh, leaders use, this is a great time to probably, you know, when people aren't commuting or traveling, they probably can spend some time looking at their network. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um, okay, guys, so we're up on 40 minutes, but um, I mean, just before we jump into the final few slides and we shut you guys off, um, any kind of final thoughts on, on the process, like any any kind of tips or tricks, but just as a final closing remark? I mean, as someone who's led a recruiting team, referrals have been my favorite source of hire. Um, and I think focusing more on diversity, which is one of the pitfalls of a referral program, um, of being intentional about diversity is the way to go. But use your own people and, and try not to have to use outside firms and, and pay your own people or recognize your own people for 
the great uh, candidates they're submitting. Great, thanks, MC. Josh? Um, let's see, I, I would just say, uh, I'd echo everything you just said, MT. This is it's just essential um, to doing business. And um, and I, I feel like I've learned through today's conversation and some of our prep conversations, um, just the ways in which we in the nonprofit sector can borrow or, or draw on um, uh, some of the practices shared today in making um, the incentives uh, for doing this easier and more seamless um, so that we actually uh, uh, put strong, smart investment behind the behaviors we most want. Yeah. So appreciate the learning I got to do as part of this. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for your contributions. Really great thoughts. Um, and I appreciate you taking the time out to cover the topic with us. And I uh, hope you have a rest of, great rest of the day. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Thank Cheers, you. Guys. Bye. Okay, guys, um, so that's the end of the session. Thank you for joining. Really appreciate taking the time to listen to Josh and MT. Um, just in terms of um, some of the background, so JobLite is obviously a company which helps a lot of the challenges we're looking at um, discussing today. Um, we have a website. Please do uh, log on, take a look around at some of the solutions and offerings um, that we put together. Um, we also have uh, a pretty packed schedule for the next few weeks. So the Summer to Evolve program does run until um, mid to end of August. So there's plenty of uh, additional um, sessions that will be running. Um, as mentioned, this will be available online. There's also the recruiter skill session on referrals that was done yesterday. It's available on the Summer to Evolve website. And we've also got a session coming up on diverse audiences. So next week is focused on DNI specifically. So we've got some great speakers. So Jeremy Bird and Kelly Payne Spencer will be joining, um, come from super interesting backgrounds, should be able to share some very diverse thoughts on DNI and the current environment we're in and how to solve some of the problems. So hopefully that's an interesting session for you. And the rest of it will be online. So thank you for your time today. Um, and do log on, take a look out at the other sessions and have a great rest of the day.